Welcome to Lime Rock 2022. As I'm sure you know, this year's Lime Rock event is August 1st and 2nd, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, my name is Bill Gilbert. Um, I'm one of NNJR's chief instructors. In fact, I'll be, uh, uh, along with Craig Mahan, uh, chiefing uh, the event at Lime Rock. But today's video is all about the classroom for uh, this event for and specifically for advanced drivers. And uh, our topic today is car control and feel. And uh, I'm sure this is something all of us work on all the time. And hopefully I'll give you a few tips and ideas that you can take away to, uh, uh, to improve um, you know, your confidence in the car and your uh, ability to control the car. As always, we have a disclaimer that says, uh, you know, this is a dangerous sport that we participate in and anything you try that doesn't work is your fault. So uh, with that in mind, let's dive right in. <clears throat> so what do we mean by car control and car feel? Well, control, we would like to think, means that the car does exactly what we ask it to do and expect it to do. And then we have confidence in the car. It's not scary. Um, now, as a, as a reminder to help us think about that in a, maybe a different way, Dennis Mascio points out that, you know, the car weighs 3,000 pounds, give or take. Uh, I don't care how big the driver is, he or she doesn't weigh anywhere near 3,000 pounds. Lucky to weigh, uh, you know, a fraction, a tiny fraction of that. So we're not uh, dictating where the car is going to go. We're guiding it with the controls. So as we're thinking about what we're doing with the gas and the steering, that's a good um, uh, thought to keep in mind. What does car feel? Well, it's the other way around, I suppose. It's, you know, do I as the driver have a feel for what the car is doing? In other words, is it telling me what it's doing so that I can predict what's going to happen and not just react? Uh, obviously, on the track, or all times we we want to know what's going to happen in advance. Well, the feel we have for the car helps us with that as we uh, as we get around the track. So, you know, if we, if we think about what the car is doing, you know, we typically think about handling, which means a whole bunch of things: balance, responsiveness, grip, and all those things. There's trade-offs. The bottom line we're trying to get to is to have confidence in the car and the car has to give us feel or we don't have confidence. Imagine driving the car and, you know, with earmuffs on and uh, and big mittens on and, you know, your eyesight somewhat obstructed. You'd have no idea, you know, all, you know, everything that's going on. You would have no confidence in the car. So, we're not going to spend any time today talking about car setup. I'm going to assume for purposes of this discussion that your car is set up reasonably well, which certainly most modern Porsches are that way straight from the factory. And if you've made some modifications, you've presumably modified the car so that you like the way that it handles. So today we're going to talk about what the driver can do to improve car control and car feel. So how do we feel the car, which is really the first and important step to any amount of car control? Well, we, you, know, you might ask yourself, well, how close am I to the limit? Well, do I really know where the limit is? Do I know if the car is understeering or when it's understeering or oversteering? Or maybe it's doing both at different times, even in the same corner. Um, if, if we don't if we can't feel those things, then we need to work on developing the skill and the and the ability to feel understeer and oversteer and so on. Now, one red flag indication is PSM. If you're aware that PSM is intervening, then obviously you're getting feedback from the car, perhaps not the best feedback in that you should be able to feel what's happening as well as the car, but Certainly be aware when that PSM light comes on, if nothing else. But the key takeaway here is that sensing the car, feeling the car is a learned skill. 
And we're going to talk a lot about that in today's presentation. And a lot of this comes from Ross Bentley, who, as many of you know, has, uh, has stressed these kinds of uh, uh, factors uh, over many, many years and many publications. So the classical way we talk about developing the seat of the pants, which is just a nice way of saying, what is the car telling me? What is what does the car feel like? These are the classic ways, skid pads, autocross, car control clinics, driving on snow and ice. Those are always good ways to develop your seat of pants. And I strongly encourage any and all drivers to do get as much of this uh, seat time as possible because in most of these situations, we can push the car, get close to the limit, maybe even go over the limit and do so safely. We do not want to be pushing the limit, uh, our limit uh, or our car's limit on the track. These are safe places to do that. But sometimes we need to or want to improve our feel on the track. Well, how do we do that? Well, you've heard me talk in, in many sessions about sensory input sessions, and I'm going to come back to those today, but kind of on steroids. So this is Ross Bentley's classical sensory input sessions, you know, where you take a session on track and do nothing but listen and listen to the wind going by, listen to the noise of the tires, the noise of the engine, and so on. Another session, we focus on the seat of the pants. What do we feel in the seat? Uh, in another session, we focus on the steering wheel. What does the steering wheel feel like? In another session, we focus on vision and we look for something new every session and so on. And those are still, if you will, the gold standard way to improve our, in, our ability to sense what's going on but we're going to add to that today. But before we do that, what is it we're sensing? I mean, what is it we're trying to feel? Well, technically speaking, it's these things, right? It's yaw, you know, how much is the car rotating, G loads, that sort of thing. Well, but as drivers, other than the visual picture here and some of the sounds, you know, we're not focusing. Well, if we could measure the yaw angle of the car, that wouldn't be very helpful. We can get data to do that, but we're just trying to integrate all this, have a feeling for what it feels like as we go faster in a, in a safe way. So how do we do, how do we really improve when we go on track? Well, we use what's called deliberate practice. And again, I've used this term before, and I'm, but I'm gonna restate it here because it's really important, as it says at the bottom here, to that how you practice is more important than the amount you practice. So when we go out to practice, whether it's sensory input or anything else, we want to do it in a focused way with a clear goal, with a plan for getting to the goal, and a way to monitor. And, and so the basics are the things here about the track, reference points, track surface, safety features, um, you know, the, the car brakes, you know, throttle steering, traffic, you know, meaning mirrors, you know, what would I do if cars show up in my mirror? And last but not least, the sensory input. In other words, we can apply deliberate practice to any of these things that we wish. Now, we wouldn't pick all of these, you know, for any given session, we would pick one, you know, to focus on on a given time that we are on the track. And beyond that, for a given event, like for Lime Rock, I'm, if there were some of these things you wanted to focus on, I would pick no more than two or three for the whole event and 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 try to improve in those in those dimensions. Now, if we want to zoom in a little bit on car control and car feel, here's a first step. Um, we would we would focus on the sensory input as a first uh, matter, and and uh, and that includes vision, the seat of the pants, the sounds, and then we'd focus on you know what are the controls telling us? 
what are the brakes telling us what what's the the feedback through the steering wheel and so on and there are if oh we can get to the next slide here um, there are deliberate practice worksheets available to help you uh, make this easy to apply in practice um, there'll be a link at the bottom of the youtube uh, i hope to uh, where you can find these worksheets for lime rock on on the website and there'll also be a link to it in the uh, uh, download of these slides from uh, uh, from the Ninjara website. But the whole point is that the, you can ask yourself qu questions or give yourself goals, if you will, for any of these topics. And I apologize that it's hard to see here, but if, if we just take as an example here, reference points, you know, we want to find reference points that aren't cones and, you know, find them for a beginning of breaking end of breaking and so on now those aren't what we're talking about today but if you are a newer driver or you haven't been to lime rock in a long time you may well want to spend you know a session on reference points and improving your reference points and if you're a new driver you're going to spend a lot of your event working on reference points for an advanced driver that's been to lime rock before hopefully those are old hat you've got a track map with your notes you know where the reference points are but there are other topics here like the uh, brake application or like vision and every one of these headings that you see here like vision and kinesthetics and so on there's actually a worksheet and the worksheet is real simple it's a track map like you see here um and these questions or bullet points are on there and the rest of it's there for you to take notes. So if you were to pick vision and you wanted to take a session for vision, you would, you know, take that sheet and, uh, you know, look at it before you go out, think about what you're going to focus on with vision, run your session, come back in and immediately take that sheet and write your notes on that sheet. So <clears throat> I strongly encourage everyone to use these sheets for whatever improvement area you want to focus on. But today we're talking about car feel and car control. So let's, and this is an advanced session for drivers with, uh, who are not the uh, students. Um, so how do we get even better? Okay, well, Ross, Fortunately, in a recent speed secrets gave us, uh, you know, a nice uh, set of let's let's call them targets or things to think about that we can apply to improve our feel on the track. So let's let's just go through his logic here, and I think you'll find out that it makes as much sense to you as it does to me. So think about it as you start to turn into a given corner, pick pick Big Bend, pick West Bend, pick pick one, is you start to turn in and and maybe just come off the brakes a touch, here's a bunch of questions to ask. Did your car respond the way you expected? Did it turn in on the arc that you wanted? Did it, res did it turn as much as you wanted or more? Uh, perhaps it turned less. Um, did the car rotate the way you wanted? Well, the question is, these are great questions because as you start to turn in and start to relax the brakes, from this point forward in the corner, we're going to decide as the driver what adjustments need to be made to make this corner an optimal corner. And to do that, we have to sense a whole bunch of things the instant the car starts to turn in. Things like, you know, the direction the car is turning versus the steering angle. Maybe we turned and the car didn't turn quite as much as we expected. In other words, it understeered, or maybe the reverse. So how much steering effort did I have to turn the wheel harder than I expected, less than I expected? You know, what's the angle of the car? You know, has the car rotated as much as I expected or less? What's our visual picture? You know. We expected 
to see certain things? Is that what we're seeing? And of course, what sounds are we making? So we're, we have to make adjustments or think about those as decisions because, you know, as I said before, what we do from this point, you know, throughout the corner dictates how successful the corner is going to be. Those decisions are the kind of the reverse or the other side of the coin of the previous slide. Do we have to turn the wheel a little more or do we have to relax it a little bit? Or maybe we're just fine to keep it steady. Do we have to continue easing off the brakes at the rate we are? Or do we have to come off a little faster or a little slower? You know, can we look at the apex and to the track out? Or do we have to get a bigger picture? Maybe we have to adjust with the throttle to make up, you know, we, maybe we got in a little too slow. We need to get on the gas a little bit earlier, a little bit more, or maybe the reverse. We maybe we need to hesitate. Now, these are all fine tuning adjustments. If you're a beginning driver, these won't make much sense. If you're driving quickly and you're starting to push the car, these will begin to make sense because we know that small adjustments early in the corner make a big difference. But how do we get how are we going to practice this stuff? Well, because we just talked about on that previous slide, there's a ton of stuff here. We're talking about gas, we're talking about throttle, we're talking about vision. We can't practice all that at once. So obviously, we want to choose just one factor or one decision and focus on that for a whole session. And that's what deliberate practice is about. And as Ross Point says here, if we pay attention to say our steering, you know, for a period of time, and that's gonna improve our ability to sense the feedback in the steering and help us make decisions at a subconscious level, because obviously we can't consciously make all of the, these decisions in the middle of a corner. And that at the end of the day, Ross says, will make you a consistently faster driver. So here are his three suggestions uh, of, of topics to use for deliberate practice. So he says, take at least one session and focus just on steering effort. How does it change if it does from the point where you turn in, you know, through the early part of the corner or the middle of the corner and as you unwind. Uh, so that is a whole session just to focus on steering, or maybe you would do two or three sessions just to get lots and lots of feedback into your fingertips as to what the steering wheel is telling you. An another focus area is car rotation, which is very much related to the release of the brakes. And so again, if we, we would take a whole session or more than one session and focus just on car rotation, as we turn in, did the car rotate? Uh, how much did the car rotate? Did I feel it? Uh, can I get it to rotate more next time? That sort of thing. Um, and last but not least, sound. A whole session focusing on the sound of the tires and the car as you're cornering, especially at maximum cornering. So to make this easy, I've added to the list of sensory input worksheets that we previously had, and I've added now four advanced worksheets. The first one just has the questions you might ask yourself. Um, and then the other three cover these three effort, these three areas that Ross suggests, steering effort, car rotation, the brake release, and sound. And as the slide says, those are available to be downloaded. I strongly suggest if you want to go this route, and that, meaning you think you've gotten to the point where this level of focus and attention will improve your driving and you could do so safely, then by all means, download these sheets because they're just a nice way to make your notes. Um, and they have the questions or the challenge in this case, you know, which is, which is, as Ross says, spend an entire session solely focused on the steering effort. And, and look at that before you go out have the sheet ready when you come in, write your notes on the on the sheet. What did you learn about rotation coming into Big Bend? What did you learn about rotation 
coming in to the left-hander and so on, and or steering effort, whatever the topic is, and plenty of room to write your notes on the, on the track map. So with all of that, let's wrap up. Um, we're talking about the need to feel what the car is doing. We, we need that in order to have confidence. Um, it's obviously an essential part of advanced driving. Now there's never a substitute for skid pads, autocross, car control, et cetera. But I've given you today some ideas about techniques you can use on the track to improve feel. Uh, you can use the basic deliberate practice worksheets and I strongly encourage you to do that. Pick one or two aspects per event, as I said. And if you're really good and you wanna get better, use the advanced sensory input worksheets and pick one or two of those to focus on at, at Lime Rock. And uh, if you do that, I want you to let me know how it goes. Um, I mean, these are very, if you want to think about it this way, fine tuning kinds of techniques to help us get better when we're already driving well. If you're not driving as well, then go back to some of those more basic techniques on the worksheets and, and get your level up to where you're comfortable enough to use the advanced ones. So with all that, I, I hope you find, found, found this helpful. And uh, uh, next we're going to, uh, let me just uh, stop the share. Next, we're going to shift gears and talk about Lime Rock itself on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. The uh, uh, Lime Rock is obviously a, uh, is a, is a challenging track. Uh, I see we're at the wrong place in the, uh, in the slideshow here. Let me fix that. Um, so we're going to do a quick turn-by-turn -turn around Lime Rock and, uh, and talk a little bit about some of the characteristics. If you've been there before, this is a refresher. If you uh, haven't been there, then this is really important. Uh, normal disclaimer uh, that uh, I'm going to give you some ideas here, but this is all on, on you to figure out to make it work for you. If you're running in the white run group, um, these are the passing zones. Uh, the uh, front straight, uh, the back straight, called no name straight, and the section after the uphill. Those are all passing right side only for all groups. Uh, those are passing zones in all groups. Everybody has to pass on the right there. All groups can pass between Big Bend and, and the left-hander. Uh, and that's a pass on either side, uh, you know, early on the right, later on the left, your choice. And in the white and lower groups, no passing after West Bend. In Black and red, we will have expanded passing, and there's th that stretch between West Bend and downhill is a pass is a usable passing zone in uh, in in those groups. Um, but uh, like always, you know, use your discretion in passing. So, Big Bend is the signature turn at Lime Rock, as I'm sure you all know. The thing to note from this diagram is that uh, the uh, shape of the turn is such that it's decreasing radius. In other words, if you think of turn two, the second half of Big Ben, it's a short, sharper radius than the first half. And that means we can carry more speed in than we can, you know, out. Well, or more speed in the first half than we can in the second half until we get to, uh, to track out. So, uh, and the other thing I want to notice, although I want you to notice, although it's not terribly well highlighted here, the line as we get into the corner past the apex, we don't go all the way to track left. We stay mid track, and in fact, on the right hand half of the track, or no more than mid track. And the reason for that has to do with the banking or camber in in Big Bend. The outer half is banked less than the inner half, so we don't use all of the track here as you might might expect. So as we approach Big Bend, and this is a heavy braking zone in all cars, um, the, the, the way I typically drive the track and have taught it is at 
somewhere in the neighborhood of the five marker or, or the four marker to, to turn the car slightly toward the apex, which is under the bridge, as you see here, and, and then brake on a diagonal straight line right across the track. And, uh, and that way we can do our heavy braking in, in a straight line. And yes, we have to make a small adjustment when we get up there, but uh, I, I tend to like that line. Um, the other, in the, here you get a better view of the apex. There's an alternative, if you, uh, which some of you may drive, and and that is to go is to begin your braking at the same point, more or less, but to wait until around the two marker to turn in. And obviously, if we're on a very heavy brake, we have to relax the brake slightly to do that. But that makes less of a turn uh, as we get past the apex. Um, on the diagonal line, we have to give the steering a little bit of extra input past the apex on this line, not so much. So th those are two different ways to approach big band. Um, you know, in, in theory, I'm told by pros, this one might be ever so slightly faster, but I find it for some drivers harder to execute, but, you know, take, take your preference. Apex is uh, is on the next to the curb or even on the curb here. Uh, there's not a lot of percentage in going over the curb, but uh, it it uh, some drivers do that. Uh, but I don't think it gains uh, it gains much here. Um, the key thing here is that as we get past the first apex, we still have a long ways to go, uh, and we need our eyes way around the corner. We need the eyes over here, but um, but we have this whole distance here that we have to cover. And notice, you know, we're going to be on the right-hand half of the track here. Um, and if we've come in fast enough to carry momentum, um, you know, that's great. That's what we want. In fact, we can carry braking well into the corner here if we've come in fast enough and been able to manage the, uh, the turn to get in. Um, but most drivers are going to find themselves balancing the car on the gas pedal at some point, uh, you know, from not too long after the first apex or certainly by the middle of the corner. And we're going to use, we're going to actually steer the car with the gas a little bit to set up for, uh, for turn two. And we want to be looking around for the flag station uh, we, to keep our eyes up, up ahead and off, off to the right. And you, you, this slide, you can get some sense for the camber uh, on on the track, so <clears throat> the key thing with with turn two is to be patient. Um, it is quite a bit tighter, and if we're early, we're going to run out of track, which has been done by a great many people. Um, and if you do happen to do that, certainly drive it off because trying to save a uh, you know a, an early apex or too much gas in turn two. Uh, results in a spin into the tire wall on the inside. So, um, so turn two deserves some respect. Um, as we, let me go back. Um, you know, at this point, we're still some distance from it. We're still balancing the car, but we we are focused on that apex and getting the car down to it, so we can get on the gas. As we do accelerate now, coming out of two, uh, and you know, we're going to use the. The track out so we're going to get all the way track left exiting two uh, generally most people find as it, that the target is the the men's room building here and it's an it's nice red building it's easy to see in a distance and much easier in real life than on this uh, on this photo and we can just drive right to that uh, that that uh, building um, as we begin to approach the left-hander um, you know, I generally recommend a car width or a little more from the right side. Um, you know, the, some people will go all the way track right here. I personally don't think that's needed, but um, but uh, everyone has their own preference here. This turn is not critical how we get into it. It's critical how we exit it because it sets up the whole back straight. And it's easy in this corner to be too early or too fast. Uh, and and then that means we end up exiting the corner track right when we want to exit the corner track left. 
the key to this corner is, is focusing on this little straight section along the left side of the track, which is where we want the car as we exit, um, because that sets us up properly for uh, the right-hander onto the back straight. So um, one thing that can help here is we can carry good speed into the left-hander and trail brake um, to help the car come around in, in many cars, um, or we can just carry some speed in and scrub it off a bit and balance it with the gas pedal. However, we do that as long as we don't overdrive it and end up track right. So here now we see that straight section along the left side of the track, and um, and we see the apex for the right hander up, up ahead. So as the slide says, you know, we want to be you know along this this white paint on the left and. As we approach the turn in point, which is kind of where the track bands a touch here, um, you know, also close to the cone, um, we can give the car a lift. And as we turn to help it turn, most there's no need to brake for this this corner in any car, as far as I know. Um, and that lift will help us uh, get the nose headed into the apex, and then we can begin to accelerate um, you know, once we've nailed the apex here. But there's a caution here, um, two cautions actually. One is the curb here isn't the friendliest curb in the world. And depending on how you hit it, it can actually push the car out. Um, now that said, we wanna get in close because there's a nice dip down in here right by the apex. And we wanna use all of that banking and camber that's, uh, that's here at the apex. The other thing to be aware of is that the track goes off camber. And so, and, and pretty dramatically, the road is highly crowned here. And so the, the right-hand half is favorable, but as we begin to accelerate and approach track out, it becomes unfavorable. And four degrees one way to four degrees the other way. Uh, so that can upset the car if you're, uh, you know, too close to the ragged edge. So. Um, so lots of surface dynamics to be aware of here. And of course, our vision wants to be way down track at and past the flag station that's on the left here. <clears throat> next is the uphill. Um, for this corner and the next, well, the next three corners, uphill, west bend, and downhill, you're going to hear me say similar things about the braking. Um, we're going to break earlier than we might think and lighter than we might think. Now, if we have to scrub off speed, we have to scrub off speed. But rather than doing that all at once with one heavy brake, um, you know, I would prefer that you brake, you know, somewhat earlier, but less um, uh, less hard so that the car stays better balanced. These are all fast corners. And if we slam on the brakes to scrub off some speed, the car is not going to be happy turning in and we're going to be slow coming out of the corner. So much better off braking earlier than we might think and lighter than we might think. Now, in a powerful car, uh, yes, you're still gonna have to scrub off serious speed and some cars will trail uh, to some extent, but in general, these are not trail braking corners. Um, yes, in a powerful you know, car like a GT3, probably gonna trail in some, but not nearly as much as you might think. So, um, this is an interesting corner because <clears throat> we can actually think of it as two corners, and thanks to actually Bertel Roos, who pointed that out to Dennis Maschio, because as we make, after we make the first turn in and we approach the hill, guess what? We can turn more uh, because the hill catches us. And so, um, so this is really, you know, two uh, uh, turns of the steering wheel, if, if you will. Um, and the key thing here is, you know, to be straight over the hill. The video, the picture is a little misleading here. The car should be further to the left uh, than, than it looks like here. Uh, but <clears throat> regardless, however we, we get to the top of the hill, we want to be straight because the car is going to get light. We're going to be on some amount of gas. We're probably going to have to feather the gas. Um, if not, you're going to see your traction control kick in on newer cars. And we don't want to go sideways at the top of the hill here. 
There's a reason the chicane is off to the right here for the faster cars. Now, <clears throat> since this is an advanced group, I will point out that the uh, uh, there is an alternative line through this this corner, which I've personally not driven uh, much, so I, I can't speak to it, uh, but I know a lot of people have, and that is to uh, approach the corner it, to not turn in at this point, but to go much further, you know, not quite this far, but to stay track left until almost this far, and then turn and go straight up the left side of the uh, of the track. And so, um, so it's more one turn than the two I mentioned before. It's one turn where you have a little more uh, hill to help, um, and it is potentially faster for some people and maybe potentially easier. So it's an alternative that's there. I'm not saying you need to try it. I'm just saying, you know, be aware that that is an alternative and you may see somebody else driving that line and wonder, you know, what, what's happening because it is, it does look pretty different as you're approaching the corner. So West Bend, um, a common mistake people make is not to stay all the way track left here and to cheat in. Um, don't do that. Let's use all the real estate here. <clears throat> this is a totally flat, as in no banking, corner and uh, <clears throat> and a pretty classic right-hand corner uh, you know, that's reasonably fast. So again, same braking technique. We want to get the eyes way ahead. And uh, in this case, we can see most of what, what's it. Well, we can see to the apex and and uh, a good bit around around the corner. The apex here is actually a zone. It's actually this whole road that's uh, access road that's on the right. And so, and actually the uphill, we want to do some of the same kind of thing and even the downhill. But here in particular, we want to run along this curve for a substantial distance, 15, 20 feet. We want to have our eyes way up ahead at the bridge, uh, you know, which is where we're headed. And again, we want to stay track left under the bridge. In fact, we want to follow that white line that's this white line that uh, you know runs down the left side of the track here. We want to just follow that left that line on the left all the way to the bottom of the hill. And, and in fact, about where that cone is, that road flattens out where the hill hits the flat of, of the front straight. And that's a good signal to tell us to turn. So if there's no cone there, um, you know, you notice the white line comes back in here too. Um, and that's also a good signal, but generally we can feel where to turn in, it, you know, the, uh, you know, where the, where the road uh, uh, hits, where the hill rather hits the flat road. Now, this is a very fast corner um, and we really need the eyes way up ahead and we need to be careful not to early apex the corner. Uh, it, it's a common mistake, even for some drivers with a lot of experience, to cheat, you know, a little bit and not stay all the way left, and to start crabbing, turning in a little bit, you know, because it is a long corner. So use all the road and and be patient on your turn in. Find an exact turn in that works for you, but you know, don't cheat with it, uh, and and uh, that'll keep you out of trouble with an early apex on, on this corner. Uh, obviously, we're going to run along this curbing for some distance, um, and our eyes are going to be way down track. Um, it's, there is favorable camber again on the right-hand half of the track here, but same issue that we had coming out of the right-hander onto no name. The front straight is crowned, and so as we um, you know go past the apex and and we're accelerating hard, the road is going to go from favorably banked to unfavorably banked. So we need to be aware that that's gonna cause the car to be nervous and make sure that we're ready for that. So that's a quick tour around Lime Rock. Um, you know, a reminder, can trail break as much as you like into Big Bend and the left-hander, much less for the other corners. Um, we just talked about the adverse camber and no name and downhill. And, you know, make sure you have good reference points that don't move and that, you know, you don't cheat on, like I mentioned, in on West Bend and downhill where many people do that. 
So I look forward to seeing you at at uh, at Lime Rock, and uh, the uh, uh, it promises to be two uh, two hot days from the advanced forecast I just looked at. But in any case, I look forward to seeing you there and to a fun, safe event. Have a safe trip up. I will see you there.